Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. And this is part three of China from 1800 to 1930, in which we discuss the end of the Qin and what comes next. So the Qin court could not reform itself. From the opium wars with the British, to the unequal treaties, treaties, to the Taiping Rebellion, to the Boxer Rebellion. The Qing court was too stuck to its conservatism. It couldn't save itself. It couldn't save China. There would be no constitution, no parliament, no limited monarchy. Because of the Dowager Cixi, they, China could not be Japan. And it could not be Western. It could not modernize like Japan. And it was never going to want to be Western. Because it was China. It was its dominant country in East Asia. And so the talk becomes if the Qing court can't reform China, do we really need the Qing? And that's where our next um, important heroic figure shows up, and that's Sun Yat sen. He is a leading constitutionalist reformer. He believed he had a statement of nationalism, democracy, and people's livelihood. He becomes leader of the Revolutionary Party, the Tomenghi, Tomenghui, and later becomes the leader of the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, of which we will talk about especially in future episodes. So for 10 years, the Qing court continues after the Boxer Rebellion, but it's spent. The emperor is in seclusion, playing with his toy trains and his clocks. He dies in 1908. In his 30s. Maybe he's poisoned? I don't know. Empress Dowager Cixi also dies in 1908. And another child emperor. So this is the very end of the Han. Another child emperor comes to the throne. In 1911, a revolt starts in the south. Again, another Ming-style revolt. This one in Hubei. The same place, I believe it's the same place the Ming revolted from. So again, it's like the Ming. It's like the Taiping. And the goal of this is to throw out the Manchus, democratize government, or at least make it a good democracy for the Han. You know, because the Han are 85% of the population. So they get democracy and the minorities get whatever the Han give them was the idea. Like, so here's the thing. When you talk about democracy, you're talking about the rule of the majority and if you vote along ethnic lines that means minorities will never win so we should understand who they're talking about democratization for so it's throwing out the manchus the foreigners democratize the government at least for the han and modernize the economy problems for the chin during this 1911 revolt was 15 provinces. Remember, they were allowed to make their own armies. Declared independence of the Qing. You got warlords that had control of money and of their own armies. The most important of these provincial warlords was a guy, Yuan Shikai. S-H-I-K-A-I. He controlled Beijing. And he wanted to be emperor. Democracy? Nah, democracy, you need to get elected. You need to be popular. This guy doesn't want that. He wants to be 
emperor. And because he controlled Beijing, he basically overthrew Sun Yat-sen to become the second president of the Republic of China. So in 1911, there's a revolt. The emperor steps down, thus ending the Qing dynasty. Sun Yat-sen is elected president. And a short while after that, he steps down so that Yuan Shikai could become uh, shall become emperor, could become the second president who wants to become emperor. But Sun Yat-sen was playing the long game. He wanted to reunite China. He needed to deal with these independent warlords. He needed an army to do it with. He didn't have one on his own. And so he needed allies. And so this was a way of getting allies. In 1913, a rebellion called the Second Revolution begins against the Republic of China. It declared Sun Yat-sen's party illegal. And Yuan Shikai was basically made king of China. Not yet emperor, but a king in China. World War I happened and China doesn't really participate. The Japanese conquer uh, the German towns in China. But then by the end, near the end of World War I, Japan gives what's called the famous 21 demands to Yuan Shikai and basically demands China become a protectorate. It's 21 demands that if, that if accepted would basically make China into a protectorate of Japan, into a colony. And so you can't become emperor if you're a colony of Japan. And so Yuan Shikai, um, Yuan turns it down, but this now makes an enemy of Japan. And remember, the Japanese own Manchuria. They own the industrial hub of China. So that's a problem. In 1915, Yuan declares himself the Hongxian Emperor. The Hongxian Emperor. China immediately falls apart. And this tells you just how bad the Empress uh, Cixi had done. By the 20th century, no one wants an emperor anymore. They don't want that government in any form. They want a republic. Now, what form the republic will take, we don't yet know, but nobody wants a new emperor. If you're going to make a new emperor, you're going to have to conquer China to do it. And so China immediately falls apart. It's the southern provinces rise in revolt. The western bankers immediately stop loaning money. And Yuan's army doesn't want to invade the south. Yuan's army is in Beijing. It's like, whoa, hey, yo. Yo, we don't want to go in the south. The last time a northern army invaded the south was the Taiping Rebellion. 20 million people died. And uh, they lost a bunch of times. And besides, Yuan is in terrible health. He's not an Alexander the Great. He's not a Kublai Khan who can invade the South. He is just not charismatic enough to do it. And he's in bad health and he dies six months in after declaring himself emperor. This brings about the warlord era. Without Yuan to kind of hold things together, not that he was doing a great job of it, but without even his prestige you get the warlords, all of these independent governor generals who basically start building their own armies. The Qing are over. Chinese Han nationalism made the Qing kaput. You couldn't have Chinese nationalism being led by the Manchus. So you needed a China for the China led by the Han, a China for the Chinese, even though, yes, there are other ethnic groups in China. 
but this is going to be a very Ming concept. It's a China for the Chinese, for the Han. Westernization and constitutionalism had won. Nobody wants to go back to the absolute monarchy of the empire. Conservatives were not ready to give up, though. Maybe a constitutional monarchy? There's still an emperor. There's still the little kid emperor. There's still a Qing emperor running around. He's still a kid, you know, but we, someone could prop him up on a throne. But what was happening was governor generals, army officers were creating their own mini states, their dukedoms, ethnic groups in the in the far off provinces were breaking away, declaring independence. Sun Yat-sen couldn't go to the West. He couldn't get help. They were too exhausted by World War One. But the USSR, the Soviet Union needed friends. Lenin had rev- had led the revolution against the Tsar had won the civil war against the czarist conservative forces, had created the USSR. The Soviet Union had immediately gotten invaded by Western countries, Britain, France, the United States. But their biggest territorial losses were to Poland. The USSR needed friends and was anti-imperialist since it had been invaded by the US and Britain and France. It was okay with doing things that hurt the UK, USA, and France. And so they support Sun and his leading general, Chiang Kai-shek, and this new group, the Kuomintang. But there's also another group that they support, a small group, a tiny group, called the Chinese Communist Party the CCP. And it had this low ranking provincial leader in a rural southwestern city 2,000 miles from Shanghai, Mao Zedong. So what we have seen is the introduction of a new character who's going to loom large in part three in the 20th century of China. What we have seen is another character, Chiang Kai-shek, who has shown up as the leading general military officer for Sun Yat-sen. The one man with the charisma and the connections to run China, but not the ability. We've seen China go from a unified empire To a warring states period, which is always what happens when a dynasty dies. It is one of the one of the um, cycles of Chinese history. When a when a dynasty dies, China falls apart into lots of states that then fight each other to see who will put China back together. It has happened at every period. And so. That's where we are, the era of the warlords, the warring states. But we don't call it warring states because then it would mean those countries are independent instead of just being part of China. And so, but in Chinese history, they would have been called warring states. They are in all ways, shapes, and forms independent. They just don't have an independent foreign policy and other countries don't think they're real countries. That said, they act like a country. They have taxation, they have law, they have government, they have an army, and they're going to fight each other. Um, we've seen the empire die. Cixi dies in 1908. The emperor dies in 1908. A new child emperor takes over in 1908, and he's overthrown in 1911. Nobody really wants an emperor anymore. And so the question is, what kind of government, what kind of China will win, will succeed. Can China be put back together again? And if it does, is it the democratic Republican China of Sun Yat-sen? Is it a militarized imperial China? Kind of a, a Chinese Miji restoration? 
of Chiang Kai-shek? Or is it something else? And that's for our next lecture in part three, when we do China in the 20th century. Well, thank you very much. That's the end of the Qing. Be safe, take care, stay healthy. See you soon.